All right, we cast Jenny Sparks, Midnighter, Apollo, and Jack Hawksmore, but there are a whole three members of the Authority left. And then I want to touch on one other character who I have a feeling will show up in the DC Authority. And if you don't remember or are not familiar, the Authority is one of those super teams that existed in the Wildstorm comics and was originally folded into the mainline DC Comics universe. The Authority was the do good by any means necessary team. They will kill, topple dictators, kill even more. They don't care. And that's why they'll be such interesting foils to Superman in Superman Legacy. So that's the team. So let's start this video with the Authority's tech guy. The engineer is magic. Real quick, you're probably like, this isn't the Aculo Zone. We were in the Aculo Zone last week, and it looked completely different. That was the temporary Aculo Zone, it turns out. I was just getting the real Aculo Zone together. So now this is the Aculo Zone, unless it changes. Anyway, back to the engineer. Real quick, let's explain this. There have been two engineers, and we are going to focus on the second. She is the engineer who is a part of the Authority. For now, sure, there's a chance that James Gunn's plan is to have the engineer in Superman Legacy be Engineer 1, and then when he dies at the end, he's replaced with Engineer 2 for the Authority movie. However, I don't think that's likely, so I'm casting for Engineer 2. But here is a super brief rundown on the first engineer because it's relevant. The first engineer shows up in issue 48 of Stormwatch. He's part of a team led by a Wildstorm Superman. No, not Apollo, not Majestic, the High. He was a hero from the Golden Age who was friends with Jenny Sparks. Eventually, he got tired of stopping disaster after disaster and tried to figure out a way to fix it. All of it. So he went and sat on a mountain for a decade, and then he got an idea. The High created a team called the Changers, made up of himself and a couple of other heroes, including one named the Engineer. The goal of the Changers is to fix society. By force? Not really. The High wanted to use things like just giving everyone free things and giving them drugs to make everyone more secure and happy. And then once everyone had all of their needs met and tripped on ayahuasca, they could decide how to run the world. The High was hitting the societal reset button. The engineer was responsible for the meet everyone's needs part of the plan. He created nanotech oases that anyone could visit for free and request whatever they wanted. This pissed off Henry Bendix, the Wildstorm evil Nick Fury, so Bendix blew up all the members of the High, including including the engineer. We never learned his name or anything else about him besides that he liked nanotechnology. Enter Angie Spica, a young superhero loving genius. When the first engineer died, he sent all of his notes on nanotech to Angie, who was able to use this information to turn herself into a superhero. Angie replaced her blood with nine pints of nanotech that she can control technopathically. The nanotech blood can cover her body, which gives Angie the ability to fly and vulnerability, and she can turn whatever body parts she needs into whatever weapon she needs, kind of like Infinity War Iron Man. Angie's story starts when she is recruited to join Jenny's authority to act as both a field operative and the team's tech guy. And Angie immediately says yes. She is psyched. Angie fits right in, she's friends with everyone, especially Jack Hawksmore. The two end up sleeping together a bunch, and she's a pretty useful member of the team. Angie can do a lot. She can fly, shoot guns, hack stuff. In fact, Angie is the only member of the team who seems to understand how their ship slash home base works. She can make duplicates of herself with the nanotech blood that comes in real handy for search and rescue missions and occasional multiple TV appearances at once, and she can sort of do anything. And while Angie is almost always in agreement with her authority teammates, she has a different vibe. Guys like Midnighter, Apollo, Jack, and some more who we will get to aren't necessarily evil, but they are dark. They tend to be mean, serious, all business. They see themselves as necessary evils doing a bad thing for the greater good. And while she can be serious when she needs to, Angie is rarely mean. In fact, Angie is the team's only real smiling face. When the Authority rescues a bunch of refugees, Angie gives them blankets and food. When a new superhero shows up that Jack wants information on, he sends Angie to befriend him. You get the sense that the rest of these guys could not join a typical superhero team because they just wouldn't fit in, but Angie could. However, she's still one of them. Every so often it breaks through that darkness and cynicism that defines the authority. And maybe Angie was always like that, or maybe everyone else rubbed off on her. Either way, Angie is not perfect. She's broken just like the rest of them. Part of Angie's cheery attitude comes from the fact that this stuff is just fun for her. She loves saving people, she loves helping, and she loves being the engineer. She can spawn a jetpack and fly to the moon on a whim. That's pretty cool. And while guys like Apollo can also do that, they don't really care. But Angie can step back and appreciate how wild all this is and how lucky she is. I'm sure you've noticed that Angie has an interesting costume. 
Besides her headpiece and some gauntlets, Angie is just essentially wearing a skin-tight silver bodysuit. And some of the panels with her are a lot, but she doesn't dress this way to be overtly sexual like, say, Emma Frost. Angie is just not trying to make an entire nanotech costume when the bodysuit will do, sort of like Dr. Manhattan. In the reboot, Wild Storm, Angie does look a little different though, more plating, sort of like early Iron Man. I'm torn on whether I prefer that. There's something cool about the simplicity of Angie's design. She's made of machinery, but she does not look like a machine. The nanotech looks like her skin. She looks less like Iron Man and more like an alien or a god. On the other hand, her nanotech bodysuit is going to be tough to throw into a movie that is at least kind of for children without ruffling some feathers. People will call it exploitative and maybe even pornographic, which sure, to be fair, plenty of superheroes have this look. Captain Adam, for example, is pretty much this. But the way Angie is drawn sometimes makes it feel different. So I don't know how they'll do it, but I hope James and company figure out a way to keep the costume made of fluid silver nanotech. Central characteristics. We need someone here with a bright personality. Sort of like Darla in Shazam, minus the childishness. Angie is friendly. Besides that, I really don't know. It's a pretty simple role. As long as the actor can seem like a genius, it'll work. But it's not like Angie is sitting in a chair doing calculations. She's in the field, fighting. Everything she does, she does effortlessly. Sure, it's technology, but as Cade Yeager always says, Any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Thanks, Cade. That's gotta be Angie. It feels like she is doing magic. I don't know how old Angie is during the first Authority run. She feels like she's maybe 30, old enough to be a super genius, but not much older than that. She might be the youngest member of the team, it's unclear. I'm gonna stick with the idea that everybody on this team had at least some of a life before this, so they're all older than Clark, who I think will be a 30 year old playing 25. Racially, I don't think this one is super important. Angie's white, but nothing about her background besides her very confusing last name really speaks to that. So I'm gonna say she can be played by any woman. And I asked on Twitter and nobody had a great answer for how I'm supposed to pronounce Angie's last name. I'm gonna go with Spica. Apparently, that is how the star is pronounced and let's say that's what she's named after. Angie's another authority member who we expect to see in Superman Legacy alongside Jack Hawksmore and another one who we'll get to. I imagine Angie's got the best chance at being a decent person who survives this first movie, reforms, and then sticks around for the authority movie. Like I said, while it's possible that the engineer in Superman Legacy is Engineer 1, Engineer 2 is way more of a character who was around for more than three issues, so I have a feeling we're going to see her here. One thing I want to think about here is her character profile, let's say. The Engineer is probably going to be the sixth most important character in this movie behind Superman, Lois, Lex, Jack Hawksmore, the likely leader, and if rumors are correct, Brainiac. So I don't think we're getting humongous talent. This is not a role for someone like ScarJo who pulls in $20 million for a movie. I imagine she'll have about as much to do as Feora in Man of Steel. That being said, I think she could be a bigger role in the future, but for that reason, I'm going to avoid A-listers. So no Anna de Armas this time. The runner's up. Okay, hear me out. I know I just said no A-listers, but I meant no movie A-listers. I could see someone like Ariana Grande getting this role. Young, bright, it could work. And if you agree with CJ the X's video, she's actually a decent actor. I don't know if she would sign for a movie like this, it could be quite the commitment, but it's possible. Look at Haley Steinfeld, Harry Styles, Lady Gaga, and so on. Someone suggested Alicia Vikander, have her play another sexy technology woman. Don't hate it. Honestly, I think she might be a bit too high profile for this role, but she would be a good pick. You know James Gunn, loves to cast a friend, so let's look at the big two here, Pom Clementif and Karen Gillan. I could see either of them in this role, and because they're previous Gunn movie vets, they've got a great shot at showing up in one of these eventually. I mean, to be fair, Pom had a cameo in The Suicide Squad, but I doubt that movie even counts, or if it did, I doubt it would hold her back if James thought she was right for this part. If I needed to pick one, I think I'd go with Pom. Hot off Mithrigan, why not girls as Allison Williams? She's the right age, just played a super genius, worked with my Hawksmore, Daniel Kaluuya in Get Out and has a career that screams just she's competent, like she could do this, and she could be pretty friendly when she needs to be. One thing I found interesting, when I put this on Twitter, a lot of the suggestions I got were for Hispanic women, even though by all accounts, Angie has always been white by way of Italian or Greek or something, but I think there's something there. Maybe part of it has to do with the fact that Hispanic women have been severely underrepresented in comics. Marvel has only a handful that have been around for more than 20 years, right? You got Cecilia Reyes, 
Firebird, Echo in the comics, it's slim pickings. So when a character does not really have any connection to an existing race besides seems white, this could be a good place to correct that imbalance. And I know I just gave a list of Marvel characters just because those are the ones I know better. I feel like Gina Rodriguez is a solid all around talent and gets left out of these conversations a lot. I could see her playing Angie. She's done action in Miss Bala and she's done down to earth comedy in Jane the Virgin. Also she's got a solid voice resume and since James wants to have all of his actors do their own voice work in animated projects, I could see her experience in Scoob and Carmen Sandiego coming in handy. And she's no stranger to DC Comics stuff either. Gina is the voice of Catwoman on Bat Wheels and was Barbara Gordon on the Batman Unburied podcast. The winner. With Allison Williams as a backup, let's take a look at the actors who came up most in my suggestions. Morbius's own Adria Arjona. I think there's something here. And I'll ignore Morbius, although I do think she played a scientist in that movie. I'm not sure. It's been a year since I last morbed. But I'm looking here at her performance as Bix Colleen on Andor. In Andor, Arjona plays a tech-savvy member of the Resistance. She's tough when she needs to be, but can also be compassionate. Her performance near the end of the season is solid. While there are plenty of actors who could play Angie, Adria Arjona is my engineer. The Doctor is in crisis. Okay, you want to hear something edgy? Real edgy? Well, what if Doctor Strange did drugs? I'm blowing your mind, right? Well, that's the Doctor. So in the Wildstorm universe, there is always a shaman. It is very much like the mantle of Sorcerer Supreme or Doctor Fate. I know that's not exactly what Doctor Fate is, but you get the idea. The shaman has the ability to warp reality limited only by their imagination and a bunch of other limitations. Each time a shaman dies, the next shaman is chosen. They are immediately given all the powers and knowledge of the previous shamans, and every shaman is more powerful than the last. So like the engineer, we met the previous shaman, and he was also part of the high super revolution team, the Changers. His job on the Changers was to drug everyone with psychedelics so they opened their mind. He started with London, then he got exploded. And presumably, immediately after that, a Dutch man named Jerrion Thorndike was chosen as the next shaman. Jerrion had a weird life. According to Jenny in The Secret History of the Authority 1, Jerrion was a multimedia millionaire by 12, a dot-com billionaire by 20, and staring into space in a psychiatric home by 21. Then he gave all of his money away and started over. And things were going great until Henry Bendix bombed the Changers, killing the Shaman, and the Shaman's powers transferred to Jerrion. Now listen, remember how Midnighter and Apollo were a decent gay representation? Well, Jerrion was pretty rough drug user representation. Not that they're the same thing, but when it comes to issues we think about and portray very differently now than we did in the early 2000s, while Midnighter and Apollo were ahead of their time, Jerrion was not. Because after he was granted phenomenal cosmic power, Jerrion had a psychotic break and got addicted to heroin. The book tries to be both ways about this. Sometimes it treats it like a serious issue, and a lot of the times the authority members treat Jerrion like a loser. And I get it, he is not incredibly dependable, and oftentimes his addiction puts the group and the world in jeopardy, but at the same time, he only got addicted because he was exposed to all the knowledge of the universe. That sounds like a pretty sympathetic situation. And over the course of his career, Jerrion kept recovering and falling back into the heroin addiction. It eventually killed him, although this was manufactured by Henry Bendix, and he was apparently clean for some time up until then. Jerrion is in a tricky spot. He, more than any other authority member, has great responsibility. He does not just have the power of the other shamans, he also has their legacy. In fact, the dead shamans all hang out in a realm called the Garden of Ancestral Memory, which the current shaman can travel to for counsel. He can literally speak to them, and that makes his responsibility greater. Think about it like Black Panther's Ancestral Plane. And in the Garden of Ancestral Memory, you wouldn't believe it, we meet some of the other shamans, and yep, Jesus was a shaman. Also, Albert Einstein and Isaac Newton. But when he's at the top of his game, he's hard to beat. Jerrion has been responsible for some incredible feats, including stopping time, completely destroying a country, and taking all the churches that worship him and turning those churches into butterflies. Essential Characteristics The Doctor is unsure of himself. He does not believe he deserves this power. He does not know if he can do the things team members ask of him. He does not know if he can be the shaman. And most of that conflict comes from that issue. We need someone who can act distressed, small, introverted. He's really the only member of the authority that acts this way. He's sensitive. When he received the powers of the shaman, the doctor became connected to all reality. When many people die, he can feel it. This takes a toll on the doctor. You need to be able to believe that he cannot handle the stress of these constant cataclysms. Let's talk about this. 
The Doctor is a redhead, and you guys know how I feel about the redhead casting discourse, but for this I will make an exception, because I really like the Doctor's look. He wears this lavender sort of tunic over a grayish bluish greenish shirt, and he's got those red glasses, so I think the red hair complements all of that. The Authority has an interesting color palette as a book and a team. These guys think they're heroes, but in comics heroes tend to look a certain way. Specifically, heroes are primary colors and villains are secondary colors, and guess which one the Authority tends to skew towards? You got a lot of black, a lot of white, Engineer is silver, and then Swift and the Doctor are green and purple. So his red-orange hair ties that together. Especially in a movie where they will stand opposite Superman in his classic outfit. And like I mentioned earlier, the Doctor is also Dutch. His name is Jerry and Thorndike, after all. But that is tricky. There are not many high-profile Dutch actors. At least not many in the age range we're looking for. And I wouldn't say it's a huge part of the character's identity like Jenny Sparks' Britishness is. I bet most people who have read some of The Authority know Jenny is British and assume the Doctor is American, but you know, that is something to think about. The runner's up. Like, Game of Thrones' as Mikhail Heisman is probably the highest profile Dutch actor working, and I think he could fit this role, but I'm just not in love with it. Partially, he is just too handsome. The Doctor needs to sort of look like a regular guy. You've also got Marwan Kanzari, who played Jafar in Aladdin and Ishmael in Black Adam. Both of those movies end with Kanzari turning into a big red monster man. So that's something. And I think Kanzari could do this about as convincingly as Houseman. I don't know, neither strike me as the doctor. So let's widen the search a little bit and focus on redheads. It's funny. I mean, he'd never do it. But you know who is a solid actor in the age range I'm looking for who can be insecure and also happens to have red hair? Benedict Cumberbatch. But like, they're not going to do that. So, nope. Could the internet's favorite redhead, Cameron Monaghan, do it? Sure, the only thing with him is he feels a little too clean. I want someone messy, who can feel like a walking disaster. That isn't always where the doctor is, but he needs to be able to get there. And I don't believe Cameron cannot do it, but he's just not my favorite for that. Like X-Men The Last Stand's Ben Foster, he feels right for the doctor. First here, he just looks perfect. And second, he's got that sort of messy look that Houseman is lacking. He's got grit, world weariness. The winner. Domino Gleason is what I'm looking for. General Aldridge Hawks, the spy. I know it's been a while, but his vibe in Ex Machina could really work here. Or more recently, his energy on the patient feels in line with what I want from the doctor. He's troubled, confused, insecure, but able to get things done. So Donald Gleason is my doctor. Swift is also here. Good luck coming up with five facts about Swift. She may have come from Neg, but probably not. She likes to fly. She's on the team. She was the doctor. She likes birds. There's a little bit more to Swift than that, but like not that much. When it comes to the authority, Swift is easily the least interesting team member. Her real name is Shen Li Min. She was a member of Stormwatch with Jenny and Jack who moved over to the Authority after the Xenomorph incident. Like I said, her origin is a little all over the place just because of what might be a retcon but seems like an accident. Basically, the Jenny Sparks origin series was framed around Jenny meeting each member of the team for the first time. Every issue is a new team member or in Midnight or in Apollo's case, team members. And there is clearly a Swift book, but in the origin bit, we don't see Swift. Only an egg that Hitler wants that is destined to hatch a magical bird person. So that must be her. Except, Swift had a previously established origin where she was just a person who had superpowers the same way a lot of people did. Like an X-Men or an Inhuman, they just showed up. It doesn't have anything to do with the magic egg. It seems like Malar, who wrote the Jenny Sparks origin books, either forgot or just wanted to be cryptic, but the egg thing doesn't gel with her original story. In my opinion, the simpler one is better. Leave her as a normal person. Shockingly, perhaps because her powers are not as godly as everyone else's, Swift works as sort of a more human member of the team than people like Jenny Sparks or Apollo or Jack. So that could be her job here, like how Hawkeye is on the Avengers even though he has a bow and arrow and the others are guys like Thor. Swift could be your everywoman. That said, she does have a bunch of powers. Swift can fly, very fast. She's got talons. She's an excellent navigator, usually the default pilot. She has heightened senses, can see and hear really far, and she has a connection with birds in nature. That's why, after the world is nearly destroyed in the number of the beast event, the surviving birds flock to Swift and become her bird entourage. They understand that she is their leader, and her connection to nature is why after Habib, the shaman who succeeded Jarian, was killed, Swift became the next shaman. She communed with the earth and convinced it to stop killing everyone, and that's where the books end. While Swift seems like the Hawkgirl stand-in for obvious reasons, she actually feels closer to Wasp, 
When she's not heroing, Swift is relaxing. She appears to have a social life, and she seems to be one of the more well-adjusted members of the Authority. She does not have a psychic break and try to kill everybody or go evil. Swift is just part of the team. Essential characteristics. Again, I don't think there's too many essential qualities to Swift. Like I said, we don't know too much about her origin. She has a Chinese surname, Shen, but she may have been hatched from a Tibetan egg. And besides that, I don't believe we really know anything else about her. So I think she should be played by an actress who is at least partially Chinese or Tibetan. Besides that, I think we go for an actress around 30. And that's about it. Swift is fun loving and down for whatever. I do doubt we see Swift in Superman Legacy since she is the most expendable member of the original seven. She could show up in authority, but if she didn't, I wouldn't be shocked. The runner's up. Lana Condor is also named after a bird, so that's something. She's Vietnamese, so not ideal, but that bird thing... That's something. Arden Cho is going to be playing June in the live action Avatar adaptation. If that takes off, I think she'd be in the right spot for a role like this. Got a suggestion on Twitter for Crouching Tiger and Memoirs of a Geisha and Rush Hour 2 Zhang Ji. Sure, I can see it. She's even in that Godzilla King of Monsters movie, so she's on WB's radar. Now I know I said only Chinese and Tibetan actors, but we obviously need to make one big exception. Palm Clementif is half Korean, quarter Russian, quarter French. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I can see that being close enough for Hollywood. And it does not hurt that besides her surname, Swift's origin is pretty malleable. Palm seems to be part of James Gunn's crew now, and I wouldn't be surprised if she ends up playing the first high-profile Asian comic character set to appear in the new DCU. And I think she'd be fine, but I think there are places where she would be better utilized, and I think there are other actors who might be a better all-around fit, like Babylon's Lee Jun Ling, Lady Faye. I think she could do it. Coming off a pretty big role alongside a ton of big stars, she has a presence. Then you've got Ellen Wong. You guys probably remember her as Knives Chow in Scott Pilgrim vs. The World. I think her more recent performance in Glow is what sold me on Wong being the right fit here. On Glow, Jenny is the young, upbeat member of the crew. She's a very good supporting character and a physical actor. I could see her working well in this ensemble too. The winner. Until recently, it was gonna be Wong, but someone convinced me of another actor, Leah Lewis. She's no stranger to the DC Universe, also in Bat Wheels as Bat Girl. Just got off a starring role in Elemental. She's a little younger than the rest of these guys, but that could be a point of difference here. And she has abs, which is part of Swift's deal. So Leah Lewis is my Swift. And that is my authority. Except I do think there is one other character that's gonna show up here that's either going to be on the authority with these seven or is going to take one of their places. He is a classic Superman villain, one I've been banging on about for a very long time. So let's talk about him. Manchester Black is a jerk. If you've seen my pitch for Superman Legacy, which you should definitely watch, you're familiar with one of my favorite Superman villains, a man known only as Manchester Black. On the surface, Manchester Black and Jenny Sparks share a lot, and that's not by accident. Manchester Black is basically a Jenny Sparks pastiche, built to answer a question. What if Superman fought the authority? Could truth, justice, and the American way stand up against brutality and totalitarianism? Little is known about Manchester Black's past, and that's part of why he's such a great villain. Sure, a villain can have a complicated backstory, but it's also fun when they don't, or when we don't know it, because it doesn't matter. We're not trying to justify Manchester Black's viewpoints or explain psychologically why someone might want to kill the villains and be an authoritarian. That doesn't matter. What matters is he does want to kill the villains. Agnostic of his own experiences, is that a justifiable position? And if not, how does Superman make that argument? And visually, it's pretty clear what Black is going for. He's punk rock, even more so than Jenny Sparks. He has purple hair, wears a very edgy late 90s, early 2000s duster, he smokes cigarettes, he's a rebel, fighting against a system that he believes is broken. We first meet Manchester in Action Comics 775 from 2001. He showed up with his new team known as the Elite and killed a big monkey and a bunch of soldiers which ruffled Superman's feathers in a big way. The Elite then went on to murder a bunch of other villains and began openly antagonizing Superman. Black served as the leader and spokesperson of the Elite, lecturing Superman about how keeping criminals alive is wrong and being Manchester Black is cool. He's got a big mouth. Not to spoil a single issue from 20 years ago, but in the end, Superman defeats the Elite and teaches them that keeping criminals alive is cool and Manchester Black is dumb. And Manchester would stay around in comics, popping up sporadically every couple of years or so. But I bet you're wondering, hey wait, you said he was in the Elite, and the Elite is different from the Authority. It is. However, the Authority was reformed very recently when an aging Superman wanted to create a team to replace him, and to lead this new Authority, Superman chose Manchester Black. So while he was not an original Authority member, 
Black did lead an authority, and one written by Grant Morrison, and if we know anything about James Gunn's DC plans, it's that he loves Grant Morrison. Honestly, I'm surprised they haven't announced an Animal Man show yet. So I think it's possible that Black's Elite and Sparks Authority are going to merge into a new authority led by either Black or Sparks or both. Hell, they could just have Black take Sparks' place completely. Either way, he's worth talking about here. Essential Characteristics Manchester Black is a jerk. That's always number one. Even when he's a good guy, Manchester Black is thoroughly unlikable. He rubs everyone the wrong way on purpose. We need an actor who can be a complete prick. Much of his jerkiness comes from the fact that Manchester Black is powerful and he knows it. So he's pretty cocky. Before he gets in a fight, he tells you how much he doesn't like you and what he's going to do to you. But hey, he's so powerful, what are you going to do? Beat him? Probably not. So again, we need an actor who can sell ego. And Manchester Black is clever. He can use his superpowers and the powers of his teammates to defeat Superman. Like, you know how every X-Men has an arc where they're introduced 50 years ago and they can do ice powers, but by now, that's evolved to mean they can instantly kill anyone by flash freezing their blood? Manchester Black and his team start there. Black has imagination. And I can't leave out that Manchester Black is British. Like, the most British. He needs to look, sound, and act like a proper punk. Look, does he need to be white? Eh, I don't really think so. I don't know. It's another white Superman black villain thing that we ran into with Luthor, but also that doesn't mean we just don't put any non-white people in the movie, right? So, I don't know. Does he need to be tall and skinny? Yeah, kind of. I expect him to look like they could slot into a punk band, like Sid Vicious or Johnny Rotten, that sort of thing. Look at Spider-Punk, a very specific frame. So I'd love one of those here. Previous versions. Manchester Black is the only member of the Authority, besides Enchantress and Natasha Irons, who we're skipping here, who has made the jump to live action, and it was fine. He appeared on the fourth season of the CW Supergirl, played by Star Trek Discovery's David Ayala. Originally, he was kind of the Punisher who was after the people who kidnapped and would eventually kill his girlfriend, Fiona. Black wore the Black Duster over a shirt with a Union Jack. If this isn't clear, in the comics, Manchester Black's Union Jack is actually a full-body tattoo because he's very edgy. After Fiona died, Black went straight villain and recruited Menagerie and Hat, two of the original comic elite members, and an alien named Mo with the power of invisibility, and made the elite. Black's elite started offing members of the Children of Liberty and eventually came into conflict with Superman, Brainiac, Martian Manhunter, and Dreamer. But since this version of Black had no actual superpowers, he got a big alien staff and stole Brainiac's Legion flight ring. Overall, this Black portrayal was fine. Ayala was plenty cocky, so he worked in the big Manchester Black speech about how heroes suck and he's cool way. My issue was this version of Black comes with the backstory. In my opinion, the less we know about him, the better. It doesn't matter why he's bad, he just is. I appreciate how much we still do not know about Manchester Black from the comics. He's a force of nature. So I didn't love all the focusing on humanizing Black early in his arc. The runner's up. I'm not gonna break a ton of new ground here, but these picks are great. A couple I don't think will work, but I still need to mention them. Like, if he was not already Batman, Robert Pattinson could play a wonderful Manchester Black. Honestly, he might be my dream casting for this role. Besides just being a stellar actor, he's got the look down perfectly, and we've seen in good times that he can play a big jerk very well. It would be the perfect opposite of his Batman, but I don't think Pattinson seems like the kind of actor who's itching to sign up for two concurrent superhero franchises. Also, if he was not already Bloodsport, Idris Elba could be a terrific Manchester Black. He might be a little older than I want, but I think he could be a little flexible age-wise with Black since, like I said earlier, his background doesn't matter. Also, it appears that Nicholas Holt was in the running for either Clark or Lex but I would not be surprised if he's offered Black instead. I've talked about it once already, but if you've not seen him in The Great, Holt plays a cocky sociopath extremely well. And he's incredibly fun to watch. Dev Patel can also play a really good tool. That's more or less what The Green Knight is. We owe him a wonderful villain role to make up for Airbender. I think he has a great villain performance waiting to be unleashed, especially one like Manchester Black who is quite sassy. Daniel Kaluuya, Spider-Punk, already my Hawksmoor, but for that same reason, he'd make a solid Manchester Black. Take some of that Spider-Punk energy and translate it into live action. Also, he would get to be British, which, outside of Spider-Punk, seems to be against the law in movies. James McAvoy is Scottish, but he could totally do this. Think Atomic Blonde. High energy. Dirty. I mean, Professor X was always a jerk, and he did a great job of capturing that side of the role. I think he'd be a wonderful Manchester Black. Aaron Taylor Johnson is all over the place these days. One day, he's doing Technicolor Guy Ritchie and Bullet Train, and the next, he's ripping people's faces off in whatever Craven is. He's definitely got the presence to play Manchester Black, and with a nocturnal animal-style performance, his Manchester Black could be a true monster. Someone online suggested Will Poulter, and I can see it. 
He has worked with Gunn before, which is an enormous plus, and I think he's got loads of charisma. I'd like to see what his version of a cocky villain looks like, but Poulter has really impressed me so far, so I'm willing to entertain the idea. Andrew Garfield. Spider-Man tends to play likable characters because he himself is quite likable. He's got one of those faces that's so likable his Peter Parker couldn't even get bullied. No one would think to do such a thing to such a likable guy. But he's also a fantastic actor, and I'm sure he could twist that likability into snarky charisma. His performance in mainstream proves it. That is Manchester Black material. Harris Dickinson is quite young and only 26, but otherwise he is in the right place for this. I do think your Manchester Black cannot be younger than Superman. He's got to have some authority in that relationship. I'd expect another 30-year-old, but if he was a little older, or if they want to turn Manchester Black into the next generation child after Jenny dies, Harris Dickinson could definitely take that spot. The winner. I looked at all these fantastic actors and I still could not talk myself out of it. Dan Stevens was my pick during the Superman Legacy pitch, and yes, partially that's because you could find clips of him flying around from Legion, but also he's got everything you want for Manchester Black. He's tall, skinny, able to play unhinged. I really like him and think he would be a stellar villain opposite Superman. So Dan Stevens is my Manchester Black. So that's the future of DC, and it's looking bright, but what about the future of Marvel? Well, I actually have another pitch video that I've been working on, this time for a little team up everybody keeps asking me to talk about called the Midnight Suns. I go into detail on what members of the team I think should be there, who they should be fighting, and just generally what will make this movie fun. And that video will be on the YouTube channel eventually, but you can watch it right now on Nebula. That's right. Nebula is a fantastic creator-owned subscription streaming service that I helped to create. Like, I'm a part of it. It is something that we've been working on forever, and we've been, you know, constantly making changes, putting it on new platforms, and I think it's in a fantastic spot. Besides just it being a very well-put-together app with lots of different you know, ways to find new content, but without an algorithm that's constantly pushing you towards a lot of things you don't want to watch, you get access to so much stuff. First of all, all my videos go up early and ad free. And it's not just like a little early. It is one full video cycle early. So by the time I am putting a video up on YouTube, it has been on Nebula for at least like two weeks. It's been doing its thing over there. Everybody's been watching it. Everybody's been talking about it. We're having fun conversations in my Discord channel about what we like about the video or, or what we don't like, I guess. But hopefully it's just what we like. I mean, I'd like to hear what we like because if it's stuff that we don't like, I will take that into account. Like if everybody says, oh, you actually need to put something like this in there, I will take that information and help to make the video a little better. Like I believe my who should direct the first MCU X-Men video was originally a little different. Like it was missing something that is in the video that's on YouTube because someone who watched the video on Nebula reached out and was like, hey, I wish you had cleared this up a little bit. I said, you know what? That's a good idea. And I was able to make the video better. So it's not just a way for you guys to watch our videos early and ad free or for us to make our own cool Nebula originals and series and plays and movies and all that kind of stuff. It's also a great way to become part of the process. You're watching these videos early and you're like pretty much the first people that are giving me feedback and telling me like, hey, this thing is good or this thing needs a little bit more tweaking. Like, by the way, when I say early, besides me and the editor I work with, nobody sees these things before they go up on Nebula. So you are seeing them very early. It really is a fantastic platform for giving you guys early videos in a way that is easy for you guys to watch them. And you guys can reach out to me, give me feedback, and that makes the whole thing better. It's it's a win, 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 win. And if you sign up for Nebula using the link below and use my code NANDO, N-A-N-D-O, you can get access to Nebula for less than $2.50 a month. It's a fantastic deal. Give Nebula a try. I know you're going to love it. As always, huge thanks to everybody that continues to support the channel on Patreon. Everybody listens to my podcast, Mostly Nitpicking. Everyone who watches these videos early and ad-free on Nebula. And everybody who follows me on Twitter, Twitch, Instagram, all those things. I'm Nando V Movies on all those platforms. That's all I got. Stay safe. I'll see you next time.